the beginning of the year, up until last week, we've been talking about change and uh, trying to be different people, not, not just because we need to change, but because we want to be more effective. You know, I think when I started talking about change, one of the things that I said, um, you know, there should, be, there should be certain things driving you towards change. And one of the main things that should be driving you towards change is the thought of others. Because you in your current state, me in my current state, we can only reach so many people. But as we change and as we grow and as our influence grows and as we become more like Christ, how many of you know that we're going to reach more people than we're reaching today? So one of the primary reasons that you should want to be different than you are today, one of the primary reasons you should want to change is the fact that you live in a world and people around you do not know Jesus and many of them are dying and spending eternity in hell. And the question is, can you make a difference in that? Can I make a difference in that? And I believe the answer, of course, as we read through the Scripture, is a resounding yes, you can make a difference in that. And as a matter of fact, God put the responsibility upon us to be the bearers of good news. And actually, he said it this way, you're ministers of reconciliation, which means your job is to reconcile sinners to God. What does that mean? It means that you're the bridge. You say, well, I thought Jesus was the bridge. Well, Jesus said you are the light of the world. People love that. Well, Jesus is the light of the world. Not if Christians don't let it shine through them. The light of Jesus does not shine into the dark places unless a Christian full of the love of God goes into the dark place and lets the light come out of them. That's why a Christian is, he said he's given you the ministry of reconciliation. He says you are the light into the darkness. You are that bridge that is going to reconcile people to Jesus. And if you do not do it, if we fail to do it, then people, there is a severe penalty and there is a severe consequence for unbelievers. So why did we want to change this year? Why do we want to be different? Not for selfish reasons, not so I can be holier or I can look better in front of all y'all. It's got nothing to do with that, but I understand this. The more I change and the more I become like Christ, then the more I will reach people for Jesus and the brighter light that I will be in this world. And as a result, fewer and fewer people will stay in the kingdom of darkness resulting in eternal damnation for them. I can affect that. You can affect that. This church can affect that. Do we believe it? Are we doing anything about it? That's the question. Are we doing anything to change? And, you know, the Bible teaches us, of course, that we are supposed to be continually shaped and formed into the image of Christ. You should occasionally look at your life and then look at the life of Christ and see, do they match? How far am I from his life? And most people, they don't even like to think about that because they go, well, that was Jesus. I'm not supposed to, I'm not going to ever be like him. Listen, you know that is not biblical. That is not scriptural that we cannot be like Jesus. Now, I understand it's true to a measure we will never be perfect. We will never be exactly like Jesus. But most people use that as an excuse to stay exactly where they're at and never change. And actually, it's completely contrary to the teaching of the New Testament, which is that we should continually be shaped and formed into His image. Listen, I don't stand up here before you today perfect or, or perfectly shaped into the image of Christ. But I can tell you what, I'm pushing for it, and I'm pursuing for it, and I'm going after it. And that's what we're doing together as a body of Christ, is we're on that journey towards change to be shaped and formed into his image. Others are moving faster than others because why? It's just it all it all goes back to how much do you how much do you want it? How important is it to you? Cuz I can tell you there are a lot of people that I know, Christians that I know that they got to a certain point in their walk with Christ, they got to a certain point being shaped in the image of Christ and they've been at that same place for the last 10 12, 15 years. How many of you know that that is not what a Christian's life is supposed to look like? It is supposed to be a continual grade upwards being shaped in the image of Christ. Now, I'm not saying it's not going to look like this occasionally. We will have our ups and downs. But in the grand scheme of it, we ought to be able to look at our, the work of Christ in our lives and we should be looking backwards at five years and going, you know, thank God I'm not at the place I was five years ago. 
Unfortunately, I think some of us look at the place we were five or ten years ago and go, oh my God, where ha- from where have I fallen? <laughs> I'm not even where I was five years ago. I'm worse. I've regressed. It's not the will of God. And it's not a message of condemnation. I'm tr- I want to encourage you and stir you up towards change. I said this, and I, and I don't want to, pre- you know, we've preached for four months on change. I'm not going to go back and, and re-preach all that. All the sermons are online. You can get them. But I said it this way, you know, there are people in this room that if you never change another day in your life, if you you, you just, as you are right now, you're good enough to get into heaven. But is that what you're really after? Is that what you're really after, to be good enough to get into heaven? Because I can tell you, if that's all you're after, some of you in this room are probably at that point where you believe in Jesus, you've accepted the blood of Christ, forgiveness of sins, and you're good enough. If that's really all you're after, you might be there. But I'm telling you, that's why I changed my focus. I'm not changing for me anymore. I know I'm good enough to get into heaven, to put it that way. Not that I'm good enough. I'm just saying it that way. We know it's not got anything to do with our works. It's It's because of his blood. We're actually talking about that today. But you get what I'm saying. I've done enough to get to heaven. I got it. He's my Savior. My faith is in Him. I'm going there. I know it. But that's not good enough for me. And if it is for you, I'll ask this question. Does the love of Christ really abide in your heart? Because how can the love of Christ really abide in your heart and you're content with your own salvation, but you look at someone else who is damned to hell and you're content with them on their path to destruction? If the love of Christ is in you, then as the Scripture says, the love of God will compel you. As we read last night from, uh, or last week from Paul, in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation. Or you could say it this way, I cannot afford to be ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God unto salvation. That's really what he was saying if you read that whole chapter. He said, I've got reason to shut up about it. I've got reason to quit talking about it because every time I talk about it, I result in stonings, beatings, prison. And he's saying, I've got reason to shut my mouth. But he said, I cannot afford to be ashamed about it because it is your salvation. It's the the message that I'm preaching that's causing me so much trouble is the very message that will produce salvation in your life. So I cannot afford to be quiet about it. I cannot afford to be ashamed. I cannot afford to be ignorant about it. I cannot afford, as many people say, well, I'm shy and I can't talk to somebody about Jesus. You can't afford to be shy to the point that you can't share your faith with Jesus. You can't afford to be it. You don't have that luxury because it's costing people. Amen. You have the very message that could bring them out 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 of darkness and into light. You are that bridge. You are that reconciler that can bring people out of darkness into the light. I I believe this. I think it was the, uh, I can't even remember his name, uh, uh, Booth, the guy that started the Salvation Army. He he was telling someone, he said, I wish, you know, he had this month, he had these months long training for the people that would be brought into the Salvation Army, his soldiers that would be brought into the Salvation Army. And of course, the Salvation Army doesn't really look anything like he originally, it doesn't look anything today like it originally did. But he made this statement. He said, I wish that the, I could somehow make the last day of my training for the soldiers that are going to be uh, finishing their training into the Salvation Army. He said, I wish I could make the last day where they could spend 24 hours in hell. He said, because when they come out of that, they would never stop sharing the gospel with people. They would overcome whatever obstacle they had to. How many of you believe if we could just catch 10 minutes of what hell was really like, that it would motivate us to get beyond ourselves, to be different, and to share our faith differently. Romans chapter 3, verse 20, if you're there. We've been talking about change, but I want to talk to you now going forward about how do we change. So you want it, you hear what I'm saying, you say, yes, I do want to change, but how do I do that? Well, you can't do it in your own strength. I've tried that, and I'm sure many of you have. Now, don't get me wrong. When I say you can't do it on your own strength, it doesn't mean that you don't put forth any effort. That is not what that means. (laughs) 
You absolutely put forth effort. You absolutely discipline your body. It absolutely takes effort on your part. But let me tell you something. It is God's grace empowering your effort that will bring the change in your life. It's that combination. It, it is not grace alone, as people love to say. Well, I am what I am by the grace of God and nothing more. And, and they put it all on God like, well, if he wants to change me, then his grace can do it. No. That is a complete misunderstanding of that scripture. And we see throughout the New Testament, Paul continually talking to believers, encouraging them to make changes in their life. They're not going to do it by their own strength. They're going to do it by the grace of God, coupled with your effort, will produce permanent change in your life. Romans chapter 3, verse 20, he says, I'm reading out of the English Standard Version. He says, For by the works of the law, no being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance He had passed over former sins. And it was to show His righteousness at the present time so that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By law of works? No, but by the law of of faith. Now, if you're anything like me, when you read a passage of Scripture like that, maybe I'm just not intellectual enough, but I've got to really meditate on that to get what he's saying. And sometimes you just read that and you go, what, what did he just say? What, what does all of that mean? Well, I'm going to read it to you out of the New Living Translation, at least a part of it, starting in verse 25, because I think, I think it brings some clarity. New Living Translation, verse 25 he says, For God sent Jesus to take the punishment for our sin and to satisfy God's anger against us. We are made right with God when we believe that Jesus shed his blood, sacrificing his life for us. Verse 26, And he is entirely fair and just in this present time when he declares sinners to be right in his sight because they believe in Jesus. Can we boast then that we have done anything to be accepted by God. No, because our acquittal is not based on our good deeds. It is based on our faith. Amen. Here, here's the, you know, the message of grace has been greatly distorted and confused in the body of Christ. I've talked to people that are so caught up on this idea of grace that they act like, you know, you can't do anything to get anything from God. But that's actually not scriptural at all, and that is not what he is talking about here. Let me, let me bring a little bit of clarity to this. Grace, in this context, specifically refers to your salvation. You cannot do anything to earn your salvation apart from faith. In other words, you can't be good enough, you can't, you know, no matter how much you did, it never would have been enough to bring you to God. I, I try to get mental pictures sometimes, you know, to help with these things. It's almost like if there was a, a post over here and you're here and there's this empty chasm and right here on this podium is where your salvation is at and there's this huge gap and you're here, you're looking over there. There's no possible way for you to get from here to there. You're there. You don't have the resources. You don't have the tools to, to build a bridge. You can't do anything. You're just here. You're isolated. There's nothing you can do to get there. So Jesus is the bridge between you and your salvation. But once the bridge is there, you might call that grace. The bridge is grace. It's there for you. But how many of you know that to get from here to here, you still have to walk across the bridge. It's not that you have no part in it. It's that in your own accord, in your own self, there was absolutely nothing you could do to get from here to here. But because of the work of Jesus, you now have a way to get there. 
Does it still take you your faith to step out? Does it still take your effort and your willpower to actually cross the bridge and get from there to there? Yes, but without His grace, you, you would still be sitting on the pole. You'd have no way to get from there to salvation. Then what James comes along and tells us is that once you're here, you're, you're at the place of salvation. Once you're here, there is going to be fruit and works that come out of your life. And let's say there's another pole over here, another post over here for the sake of our illustration, that the works, your good deeds, all the things that you're doing, they should be coming out of your salvation and being set upon this pedestal over here. The Bible says, so that the world may see your good works and give glory to God. And here is what the book of James, because a lot of people say, well, the book of James contradicts, you know, everything that Paul says because Paul says it's by grace. It seems like James is saying it's by works. That's not what he was saying at all. For the sake of our illustration, what James is saying is, is that when I look at this column right here of works, if it's empty and there's nothing there, what I'm telling you is you never came off of this post. That's what I'm telling you. It's not that those works did anything to get you from there to here. They're on the other side. They have nothing to do with you getting from there to here. There's something that comes after the fact. The good works, the good, the good deeds, all the things that we should be doing as a Christian, our prayer life, uh, our, our service, our giving, all that is over here. And they come from being in this place. But what James is saying is that when I look at your life, if, I, if this column over here is empty... If there's nothing there, what I'm, I'm not telling you that they can produce salvation, but what I'm telling you is if, there, if this column is empty, it's because you never left this post over here. You might can call yourself a Christian. You can say what you want to say. But this is how we bring an understanding of grace and works. They go hand in hand, not because the works can bring you from that place to this, but that once you're in this place, they have to be visible. They have to be there. If not, you never left there. And that's why we have many people in the body of Christ that call themselves a Christian, but they look no different than the world. And they always say, well, it's not what I do. It's about the grace. No, you, are, you have a tremendous misunderstanding about what the grace of God is. The grace of God is not, for you, is not an excuse for us to have no good works in our life. The grace of God is not an excuse for us to have no compassion for the lost. The grace of God is not an excuse for us to have our, a life full of sin and say, well, yeah, but the grace covers me. No, that is not the purpose of the grace of God. That is a profound misunderstanding and, I believe, a lie from the enemy about what the grace of God is. The grace of God gets you from a state of being lost to a place of being saved in a way that your works never could do it. But once you get there, praise God, how many of you know that the works the good works are going to flow out of you for the world to see them so that they might give glory to God. Amen. Amen. Now, what Paul writes in the New Testament, in the book of Galatians, we're going to go, we're going to go through the book of Galatians a lot this morning, but Paul wrote to the, to the Galatians about a problem that they were having, and their problem was not from here to there. It was from here to here. This is where their problem was. Because they were coming out from under the law, they were, they were Jewish believers that had been under the old system, of, and the old system was being made right by your works, being made right by your, by your law, by keeping the law, by keeping God's, God's covenant, God's decrees. So they were coming out of that system. And... You can imagine coming out of a system where you are used to earning God's approval. You know, you're used to judgment being poured out upon you if you did, you know, little things wrong. They were coming out from that system. You can imagine now they're being told that's not how you're made right with God. It's not of the law. You, it's a gift. All you have to do is receive the grace to be saved. They're, they're having a hard time understanding this. And so Paul is having to write to them because they were going back to the old system of trying to be made right in God's sight through works. 
And so he's writing to them in Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. He says, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and then do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. Amen. The good news of the gospel is that God brought us, made a way for us to come out of darkness into light, and you didn't have to do anything to earn it. You didn't have to live, you didn't have to, you know, live some holy lifestyle before you could get salvation. That's why Ephesians tells us, no, while you were still a sinner, the grace of God was poured out for you. So, what Paul is addressing is how we come to God. How do we get to this place of salvation? How do we get to a place where our spirits are born again? He says the only way is by faith in the grace of God, faith in the blood of Jesus, faith in the blood that was shed for you as a sacrifice by Jesus. Now, is this an important issue or not? I think, it's, I think it is of, of paramount importance. Number one, the whole book of Galatians is about this issue. If you go read through the whole book of Galatians, I think you'll have a lot better understanding of this. So we've got an entire book of the New Testament devoted to it, but it's not the only one because the book of Hebrews is devoted to almost the entire, the, almost the entire book is devoted to the same issue which is about people trying to go back and make themselves right with God by stuff that they do. How does this relate to you and I? Well, I feel like even once we've reached this place of, of salvation, we're right with God, we've gotten here by grace, we've gotten here by faith in His grace, and now we're saved, I feel like we can apparently gaze from our place of salvation to our column over here of works and think that it somehow relates to our salvation as far as is God pleased with us or not. Listen, the, the, the talk about works, the, the, uh, the idea of us having to have works in our life to prove our salvation is not meant to cause you to question the grace of God. It's not meant to cause you to question whether or not you're saved. It's, it's merely a point for evaluation. It's really a point for you to look at your life and say, is there true fruit of repentance? You know, how can I be shaped and formed in the image of Christ? But let me tell you something. If you're saved this morning, if you've given your life to Jesus, you know that you're a Christian. You ought not be continually looking at this, at this, po at this column over here of your works and thinking that when they start piling up and it starts getting bigger and bigger that you're somehow more right with God than a person whose column is a lot more sparse than yours. You know, you start looking around at other people's column of works, and you're going, well, they've only got two or three crowns on theirs, but mine is stacked up to the ceiling. And you think that somehow you're more right with God because you have more works or you have more good works than someone else. How many of you know that's a problem? Why is it a problem? Let me, listen, it's not just like, oh, God doesn't like that. Let me, let me explain to you how important this is. When you do that, where your faith lies is shifting. You are, when you start to do that, you're shifting your faith from the grace of God to works, and you don't even realize it. When you start to evaluate other people's works and your own works, well, mine's better than this, and I'm somehow more right with God than the other person, you're transitioning to that place where your faith is in works to be made right with God instead of His grace. And I'm going to tell you that that is an extremely dangerous place to be, so dangerous that there are going to be people on the day of judgment who stand before God and he will look at them and say, I do not know you. Who are those people? Who are those people that stand before God on the last day and they thought they knew him? And he looks at them and he says, I do not know you. What, what's the first thing that they start doing when he says that to them? They start going through their works. He looks at him and says, I do not know you. And their response is, 
But Lord, did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we, in your name, did we not do many wonderful works? What do they start going through? They start going through their works. How significant is this? Why? What does that show? It shows that their faith was not in the grace of God. It was not in the cross. And I'm telling you that this is paramount importance. And I've said this last week. If you stand before God on that day and he asks you, why should I allow you to come into this heaven? I don't think he's going to say that, but if he does, do not start going through a list of your works. That is not the answer. Do not start going through all the stuff that you did because it has nothing to do with your salvation. It's actually evidence against you. If you start going through your works, it is actually evidence against you that your faith was not in the blood of Christ, but it was in your works. If you're standing there and he says, why should I allow you into my heaven? I'm going to say, grace, <laughs> the blood of Jesus, Lord. The blood of Jesus that was shed for me, I do not deserve to be here. I could not earn to be here, but my faith was in the blood of your son, the sacrifice that was paid for my sin. That is the only reason that I'm allowed to be here. And I'm telling you, this is not like a small thing. you got to get this. This is not like a small thing, like, okay, yeah, I, I sort of got to have my faith in God. If I have a misunderstanding about works and, and grace, it's okay. It is not okay. And I, and I, I just feel so compelled to, to get this word to the body of Christ. It's not okay. We have to make sure that our faith is in the blood of Jesus. That is the only thing that can produce salvation for you. And this is why people, you know, that are of the world, they get so offended by this message. Are you telling me there's only one way? That, you're telling me all other religions, if they don't trust in Jesus, they're, they're going to hell? That seem, that's so close-minded. It's so narrow. Listen, I'm telling you, even as somebody who thinks you're a believer, you better understand this. Jesus is the only way. No amount of your works can produce it. Do not think that because you decided one morning, you know, I think I'm going to try to get things straight in my life. think I'm going to, you know, maybe, maybe you had some tragedy. Maybe somebody died in your family. Maybe you had kids and it, it opened your eyes. Maybe you got married. You're like, yeah, I'm going to settle down and start getting things great. And you start going to church and you start trying to be a better person. Do not mistake that for being saved. Because it has nothing to do with it. Do not think that because you go to church on Sundays and you say, oh, I just want to be a little bit better person. I'm going to start changing these habits a little bit. Listen, you must be born again. Your spirit has to be rebirthed. God does not take an old spirit and tweak it a little bit. The Bible says that a new you, a new spirit is rebirthed within you. You are not even the same person. Do not think that, oh, I'm going to tweak a little bit and I'm going to be good with God. No, your, your righteousness, the Bible says, what's righteous in your own eyes is as dirty, filthy rags before him. You could never do enough. You could never change enough. You could never be enough to earn the salvation. It's going to be as filthy rags before him because you can't understand the holiness of God. The, the most pious, humble, holy human that's ever walked the planet other than Jesus is as dirty rags before the Lord. It's, it's not good enough. But it's okay because he didn't ask you to be good enough. You know, it's not like we can look at God like we do sometimes with our parents, you know, when we were young. Say, God, it's never good enough. <laughs> no matter what I do, it's never good enough. Exactly. And he didn't ask you to be good enough. He's not looking at you saying, can you do a little bit more? You know, can you, can you come up in this area a little bit more because I'm still not pleased with you? No, you can never do enough. He's not asking you to do enough. His son paid it. His blood purchased it. And you have salvation because of it. But you have to know that and your faith has to be in that. And when you come into prayer or you come into church and you start feeling condemned, now, there's a huge difference between condemnation and conviction. Huge difference. Conviction is from God. Conviction is from the Holy Spirit. 
I'm thankful for conviction. Praise God that the conviction of the Holy Spirit comes to me and convicts me of sin because I know about it and I can change. If I didn't have the conviction, I'd never know. But condemnation is from the devil. He's the accuser of the brethren, the Bible says. And condemnation is when you have sin that you've been forgiven for, you've repented for, you've turned away from, and now Satan is trying to condemn you about sin that you've already been forgiven for. Or it's making you feel bad about something that God is not making you feel bad about. In other words, people come into church and they hear certain things or they, they're in prayer and they, they try to go to God in prayer and they feel, they feel dirty or they feel unclean or they feel, you know. I'll tell you, many times that's not God at all. Many times he's looking at you saying, look, I, I know you inside and out. I know all the bad parts about you. I know every thought that you've ever had. I know every word that you've ever spoken. And I believe he's looking at believers and he's saying, I still accept you because it has nothing to do with how good, bad, or ugly you are. I accept you into my presence. You are welcome here. When I go to God in prayer, I'm that way. I'm no different than you. I mean, I go to God in prayer, and there are times I go in, and I feel like he's not happy with me. I hadn't prayed enough, or I hadn't shared my faith enough, or I hadn't, you know, done something enough that I've been wanting to do and didn't do. And sometimes you go in there and you feel that condemnation, but this is when you turn your faith to the grace, and you say, it has nothing to do with how I feel because His grace is more powerful than our feelings. And I, this is where I turn my faith and I say, no, I am accepted into the beloved. I am an accepted son of God because I didn't earn this place. I didn't earn this ability to be able to come into His presence. Jesus earned it for me. And because of his blood, the Bible says in Hebrews, I have access into the throne room of God because of the blood of Jesus. And I can come boldly, not condemned. I can come boldly into his throne room, boldly knowing that I have right standing with God because of the blood. Glory to God. God. Amen. So Paul in Galatians chapter 3, he's writing to the Galatians. He's trying to explain this. He says, anybody who is relying on works of the law are under a curse. That is very strong language. But the wording is key. He says, if you are relying on, if you are depending on works to make you right with God, he says, you're under a curse still because you're still under the law. Verse 11, he says, the righteous shall live by faith. This is actually, Paul is actually quoting Habakkuk 2, 4 where it says, I love the way Habakkuk says it, though, because it says, the righteous, shall, the righteous will live by his faith. See, when Paul quotes it, he says, the righteous will live by faith, as if it's this, you know, as if faith being this ambiguous, you know, principle or value out there, the righteous will live by faith. But Habakkuk says, the righteous will live by his faith. Your faith, everybody has their own faith. You know, and we've all heard it one time or another. You can't ride the coattails of your parents. You know, you got to get your own faith, and it's true. You have to get, you have to have your own faith. When you stand before God, <clears throat> you will be standing alone. You will not be taking your wife or your husband. They will not, they will not come up there with you. You will be standing before God by yourself. And if you're one of those, those people that, you know, or, or a child or a teenager that you, you know, you think everything's good because my parents are holy or you think everything's good because your wife is holy or your husband is holy and, and he's living for God and, all, and you think you're okay. No, no, it, it will have nothing to do with what your close acquaintances, friends, family members do. You will stand before him by yourself and you will give an account for <coughs> your faith. The righteous will live by his faith. Verse 12, but the law is not of faith, but the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Glory to God. 
I'm going to read this last scripture. I've got just several pages of this, but we're going to we're going to hold it till next week. We don't have to get it all in one Sunday, do we? As long as you're going to come back next week. If you're not coming back next week, I'm going to hold you a little bit longer so we keep talking about this. If you promise to be here next week, then I'll cut it short this morning, or I'll just make it normal anyway. Galatians chapter 4, verse 9. Turn there with me, and we're going to finish up this morning. Galatians chapter 4, verse 9. See, we're just kind of going through Galatians. I mean, we're just picking out different scriptures. Of Gal- All of this is in Galatians. I mean, I-, I encourage you between now and next week to go read it. It's only six chapters. It wouldn't take long to do it. But read it and, and get the, the spirit of what Paul is trying to say here. Galatians chapter 4, 9. He says, but now that you have come to know God or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid that I may have labored over you in vain. Now this is such a a crucial passage right here because he's, he's looking at it and he's saying, look, you were at a place with God He actually says to him in another place in Galatians, he says, I presented the gospel to you so clearly that it's as if I drew the the crucifixion on a sign for you to look at. He said, it was made so clear to you. How, after seeing that, can you go back to trying to be justified by your works? And in this, this last statement that he says right here, he says, you observe days and months and seasons and years, and I'm afraid that I have labored over you in vain. Wow. What is he saying? He's saying that, that all of my work, all of my prayer for you, it might have been in vain. Do you, do you understand what he's getting at here? Can you read between the lines what he's saying here? He says, everything that I've done will be for nothing if you go back from trusting in the grace of God and putting your faith in the grace. If you go back to trusting in works, we will have lost everything. Everything that I've done will have been in vain. All of my sacrifice, all of my prayer for you, it will be in vain because you, will, you have lost the thing that we've been working for. People love to get hung up on this thing. Well, you know, once saved, always saved. I mean, can you ever lose your salvation? People go on about this thing. I'm just telling you what Paul said here. He said, if you go back to trusting in works to be made right with God, he said, everything I've done will have been in vain. We will have lost it. The other thing he says here, he says, you observe days, months, seasons, and years. I'm afraid that I've labored for vain. So when he starts talking about the days, the months, the seasons, the years, he's talking about the festivals and the special Sabbath days and stuff like that in the Old Covenant that they would observe. And he's looking at him. He's saying, that's ridiculous. Why would you do that? I don't know if you know it or not. It's not real popular around this area. But you know, people are going back to that. Certain groups of, of Christianity are going back to where they're, they're like celebrating all the old festivals and they're keeping time with the old Jewish calendar and stuff. Why? It has nothing to do with our salvation. Did you know, I'm sure many of you knew, not going to uh, you know, name it, but there's an entire denomination that is built on having the correct Sabbath day. And that's what he's saying right here. Do you really think that keeping the Sabbath has anything to do with your salvation? The old covenant is gone. The old way of pleasing God is gone. You cannot be made right by keeping a a Sabbath day. You cannot be made right. Listen, if we decided it's a cultural thing that we're having church on Sunday and for whatever reason we started having to have church on Monday, how many know we're still going to be right with God? You don't have a thing in the world to do with what day we have church on. That is religion. And it has nothing to do with the heart of God. He says, why are you keeping these days, months, seasons, and years, and all these festivals? He says, if you go back to doing that, we will have labored in vain, and we will have lost everything. I want to encourage you this morning... 
I have a tendency to focus in, in ministry, to focus on the works side of it because you can look at people's lives and I, and I see, you know, um, I'm hard on myself and sometimes, you know, even, even in, our, in our ministry, you know, you don't want to focus too much on the works side of it because the works are good and they need to be there and they have a purpose. As a matter of fact, they have to be there. And sometimes it's frustrating to look out um, at the Christian world, especially in America, and you look around and you go, gosh, we're not, we're not doing enough. Not because we can be saved. We're just not doing enough because of the, of the people. Yeah. And, and so if you focus on that, it's not because it's going to make you any more saved, but there's a focus there because there's so much more we can do and our life is short. But the danger is that you push people, we push people to focus so much on works that they forget it has nothing to do with them coming to salvation. And that's why I wanted to bring this this morning because we've been talking about change so much, but we've got to understand there's only one way to change. There's only one way that true change comes, and it is by the grace of God coming upon us by our faith in the grace of God. Now, we're, we're talking about the, the one aspect of grace but as we continue talking about grace, we're going to also get into the fact that the grace of God actually empowers you. That when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, the grace of God now is in you to empower you and to strengthen you. And we're going to focus on that as well. But I wanted us to start by getting the foundations and the very basics and understanding of what grace is and the fact that we need it and our faith has to be in it to be made right with God. Amen. Amen.